Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today at Jetro Chicago's JConnect webinar series with our next topic as 3D printing. My name is Kevin Kalb, Business Development Specialist from Jetro Chicago, and I will be moderating the webinar today. The purpose of the JConnect webinar series is to help connect innovative North American companies to Japanese affiliated companies. This aims to improve the productivity of Japanese companies as well as with accelerating their open innovation strategies. Plus, this helps American companies to expand their business with Japanese customers in the US and in Japan. By the end of each JConnect webinar, you'll have a better understanding of attractive US companies in a variety of business sectors, as well as local innovation ecosystems. If you'd like to know more about local innovation ecosystems in the Midwest or to partner with innovative companies, please feel free to contact Jetro Chicago. Today's topic is 3D printing, which is an industry that is expected to grow to a $35 billion market by 2025. Increasing adoption of 3D printers in healthcare, automotive, aerospace, and consumer electronics verticals is likely to drive the market growth significantly. Just as we do not expect the electric vehicle to replace the traditional gasoline powered vehicle in the next decade, 3D printing is unlikely to replace many traditional manufacturing methods. However, there are many applications where a 3D printer is able to deliver a design quickly with high accuracy from functional material on top of cost savings. Today, we bring you three companies from Illinois and Minnesota to share their innovative technologies, material breakthroughs, and disruptive business models towards uh, supply chains and traditional manufacturing. So I'd like to now share a few housekeeping notes. First, here's how to operate the control panel for questions. Your microphones are muted to avoid no noises. For this reason, questions should be entered in the, in the question box uh, labeled question in the control panel. You should see that. You can also leave a question in the chat. You can vote up questions that you have interest in. All of the questions will be answered after the three presentations have concluded. Today's talk will also be recorded and both video and, and handouts will be sent to you after the webinar. In addition, you will be asked to complete a survey questionnaire after the webinar. Please note the simultaneous translation to Japanese is only available live, and you should see that channel at the bottom of your screen as well. So in the unlikely event that the webinar system shuts down for any reason, we will reboot the system. So please log in again for a few minutes uh, with the join webinar uh, button. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker from Impossible Objects, Jeff DeGrange. Impossible Objects will introduce their compositive based additive manufacturing technology, CBAM, an entirely new process that is fundamentally different from conventional additive manufacturing technologies designed specifically for composites. It produces stronger parts up to 10 times faster than traditional composite methods with more design freedom and a broader selection of materials. Jeff DeGrange joined Impossible Objects as Chief Commercial Oper Officer in April 2015. Jeff is a former vice president at Stratasys, a worldwide provider of 3D printing technologies and services. And prior to Stratasys, Jeff was with the Boeing company where he led the certification and qualification of flight hardware built with different advanced, sorry, additive manufacturing technologies for the FA-18 Super Hornet and 787 aircraft programs and advanced manufacturing initiatives. Jeff is one of the founders and past chairman of the Direct Manufacturing Research Center at Paderborn University in Germany, and serves on several industry advisory boards. Jeff has a BS in industrial engineering from the University of Iowa and MS in mechanical engineering from Washington University in St. Louis. So Jeff, if you wanna go ahead and switch your screen over here, you can take over with your presentation. Great. We see you here. Can you see me? Yes. Well, well, thank you, Kevin. And hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining. Impossible Objects is a company, a small emerging technology company located in Northbrook, Illinois. We're about 40 employees, about seven years in business. And um, we have a new technology out that we refer to as composite based additive manufacturing, CBAM for short. And um, this is a very different additive technique. It's more uh, classified as a lamination technique than um, some of the ones that you might be more familiar with. 
So I need to kind of uh, tell you a brief little story on how this all got started. So the founder, Bob Swartz, basically grew up in a 2D print shop advertising um, company in downtown Chicago. And so Bob was used to working with uh, 2D printing uh, presses. And as many of you know, um, 2D printing presses can convey various sizes of material at high speeds and correlate and stack uh, very robustly and have been doing that uh, for decades. And so the idea came is how do I actually uh, build upon a 2D printing uh, technology that uh, has been very robust for doing high volume production uh, for, for newspapers and magazines for decades and uh, switch that from paper to a more meaningful material. And, and the end goal would be is high speed printing of end use parts or tooling that would have real benefit for various industries for, for production applications. And then the last item was is that with all that being said, um, how do I also basically get a third dimension to uh, 2D printing and be able to do it with a wide range of materials? And hence, um, as you'll see here shortly, um, composite based additive manufacturing, CBAM, was born. Now, um, I'm going to tell you that this basically requires three pieces of equipment. Um, in additive manufacturing, besides just the actual additive system or the 3D printing system, you usually have a number of downstream um, um, pieces of equipment in order to get to your finished products. Uh, no different here with uh, the CBAM technology. Uh, what you see there in step one is the CBAM 2 printing system made by Impossible Objects. Uh, that's what we're uh, using and selling to uh, the market, the market mainly being North America at this point in time. Um, the second step is that we'll you'll see that we're going to take the printed fiber sheets and then form them in a compression press. Uh, in, in a compression press. Um, and that's where we form, form the parts. Um, and then the last step is that once we actually form the parts, you have to remove the, um, the composite parts um, in a blast cabinet. So you need all three pieces of these equipment in order to uh, have a composite work cell. So this is how the technology works. Imagine producing complex carbon fiber and other composite parts at production speeds and volumes. Impossible Objects' groundbreaking patented composite-based additive manufacturing technology, CBAM, produces strong, lightweight 3D composite parts that are printed up to 10 times faster and available in a wider selection of materials than conventional 3D printing. Here's how it works. The process starts with a CAD model of the part. The model is sliced into thin layers and prepared for printing. The machine starts with a stack of sheets. The images of the layers are printed with an aqueous fluid onto fiber sheets. The sheets pass through a powdering system where polymer powder is flooded onto the sheet. The powder sticks to the sheet where the fluid is deposited. The excess powder is vacuumed off and the polymer is selectively deposited on the sheet. Microscopically, you can see polymer particles penetrating the sheet. The process is repeated for all of the layers of the part. The sheets are then stacked to complete the entire printed geometry. The final stack is compressed and heated to the melting point of the polymer. The particles melt and encase the fibers to fuse the layers together into a solid part. The fused spill block moves into the sandblasting unit. The uncoated fibers are removed, revealing the finished part. Impossible Objects C-band printing process produces stronger parts, faster than traditional 3D printing methods, with a broader range of material options. For more information, please contact Impossible Objects today. As you can see, it's a very different additive technique to making parts versus what you might be used to today. So now I'm going to show you 
um, talk a little bit about the materials. Those fiber sheets that you saw in the start of the video, rather than thinking about this as rather than a, a stack of paper, you're going to put a stack of fiber sheets in. And these fiber sheets that we're using uh, can, can either be a pan carbon fiber, it could be a fiberglass sheet, or it could be a Kevlar sheet. Um, but that's basically the build material is these different non-woven fiber sheets. And what I want to uh, highlight with what makes these sheets so unique is uh, we can get them in different fiber lengths. Uh, the two different types of sheets that we're working with is basically 12 and a half to 25 millimeter uh, fiber lengths in the sheets. They are non-woven, so they do have a random dispersion, but that's where we're going to get our strength properties at is with these longer fibers that happen to be in these, um, these sheets. Um, so a lot of, uh, a lot of different op uh, options as far as the different feedstock that you can run uh, with the fiber sheets in the CBAM process. You saw once a image was printed onto that fiber sheet, it then went underneath a curtain coater of powder. And what you're seeing here is your typical um, plastics pyramid. And typically as you move up the pyramid there, whether it be amorphous or crystalline materials, that um, um, the performance of those materials, whether it be strength, uh, temperature resistance, chemical resistance, or others, uh, increase as you move up the performance. And at the base of the, base of the triangle there, those are your more cost-effective uh, materials that are typically used for a lot of different products out there. Our main focus at Impossible Objects is really kind of looking at the higher performance materials. Uh, one of the materials that we're working commonly to date is the peak, the peak polyether ketone material uh, for its temperature, strength, and chemical resistance, as well as that we're working with some of the engineering and uh, engineering polymers such as nylon six which is commonly used in the automotive industry, and then your nylon 12, which is just kind of your general overall high performance polymer. Um, these polymers that we're using in the system on average is, a, is basically an 80 micron particle size, uh, very similar to what you might see in your powder bed uh, systems commonly being used today worldwide. So, where does the impossible objects CBAM technology kind of fit when you look at it to the typical material uh, chart? And this is your, your strength to the strength to weight uh, density chart. And that little blue circle there in the center is kind of where we're at today with material properties around the CBAM material combinations. And what's interesting is that um, we have a very, uh, we have a similar strength to weight ratio as a 6061 aluminum, and we're about half the weight of a 6061 aluminum for those similar strength to weight ratios. So very beneficial if you're looking to have something of stronger properties, uh, lighter weight. And then that shaded region uh, where you contains other types of materials such as polymers, rubbers, um, porous ceramics, and kind of lower tier uh, cast metals. Um, this could be products that have um, material properties, uh, strength to weight material properties in that range that could be a candidate of looking at a composite system uh, such as CBAM um, as a substitute if you need to um, improve performance of your product. So the next, uh, the next area that I wanted to kind of highlight is, you know, what's the part accuracy? Uh, and what you see on, on the very top line here is a typical, um, and we've done a number of different uh, test articles from large corporations as well as the NIST test articles, building these test articles with our standard parameter sets, uh, comparing them, uh, comparing those test articles built with the standard selective laser sintering and fused deposition modeling or extrusion techniques and kind of looking uh, comparatively far as that feature detail, surface finish, things of that type. So. Starting on the left side here and kind of just working your way down, um, if you kind of look at um, some of the test articles we made to date and look at concentricity of holes, you can kind of see with the CBAM uh, results that we actually have a, a pretty good shaped, uh, nice round hole on the side of the parts. When you contrast that to laser centering and fused deposition modeling, um, you, you start to see, um, start to lose your, your circular shape with 
those technologies. Now, bouncing over to um, the right side here, looking at thin wall features. Um, so this is basically looking at the fidelity of the original design, what kind of uh, retained wall thicknesses can we have? So looking at CBAM, you can kind of see all of those different thickness walls on that coupon um, and uh, how you can kind of visually see all those. It's more pronounced if you were holding this in your hand. And then you can compare that to laser centering. Um, the smaller wall thicknesses all kind of start to form together if you start to get really thin features and then they just don't show up with an extrusion process uh, when you start getting into really thin features. Pretty typical uh, if you couldn't conducted this experiment yourself. And so um, this is kind of my, my last uh, slide. It's just like, so where is this new technology being used at? It's mainly in North American companies, but I wanted to kind of, and it's being validated uh, at various stages of validation for uh, factory tooling as well as end-use part applications. So I'm going to start with the electronics industry. So the electronics industry, because of printed circuit boards, the product mix and the volume and, and the, the constant change going on in the electronics industry, they have a lot of what they call surface mount tools. Um, so we found a number of different surface mount tools that can utilize the actual um, carbon fiber peak, uh, which gives you the temperature resistance that's needed for uh, a wave soldering operation. And then after so many duty cycles, it has to go through chemical washes and uh, the tools can be made faster at a lower cost than conventional techniques of making these uh, surface mount tools for um, printing electronics. Um, the second area happens to be automotive. Um, Ford's the, uh, the public one that has, uh, has uh, this technology that's being validated for, for factory tooling as well as in use parts. We all also are working with a number of tier one. And um, the whole purpose there is for light weighting is how can they actually be using this technology to identify the right types of components uh, to replace metal components with composite components to say for the sake of this uh, webinar, it's gonna be a 50% um, parts reduction. And then um, supply chain security also improves for them. So if they uh, need to have spare parts in the future, uh, they don't need to carry the amount of inventories because the inventory happens just to be the digital file that's on a server. Uh, once you get to a minimum quantity, just repeat, uh, reprint the quantities you need. But it's all about light weighting and for the transportation sector, when you lightweight, that translates into increased fuel efficiency, uh, reduce CO2, um, and then ultimately for um, electric vehicles, that also means uh, increased uh, increased ranges as well as uh, payloads for for electric vehicles. Uh, moving on to the defense side, um, we have systems at uh, U.S. Air Force outside Hill Air Force Base in Salt Lake City. Um, a number of non-structural park families have been built for six different Air Force platforms. These are platforms that um, they cannot get spare parts for, so they're no bid or um, they just simply can't find. And so either techniques, reverse engineering techniques are, are being done to get a digital file to then enable the additive manufacturing or where CAD files do exist. We can then take those CAD files and build uh, the parts on demand. And it's all about sustainment and su supply chain security. And so big opportunity to use this technology for a variety of part families for making, uh, for sustainment efforts within the defense industry. And then lastly is aerospace. Um, a system is at the National Institute of Aviation Research, uh, which is a certifying agency located in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, any types of uh, structure, that needs to be certified for flight hardware, whether it be for NASA going into space, whether it be commercial aircraft for the FAA or for um, um, the DOD. NIAR is one of those only agencies that can help certify structures. And so the main focus with NIAR for this technology is really kind of twofold. Initially, it's going to be focused on using this technology to make lightweight components for the unmanned air vehicle community. Um, for obvious reasons, if you can lighten uh, an unmanned vehicle, um, it has extended ranges as well as increased payloads. And then the second area is that can we start to look at secondary or, or primary structure uh, at, for this technology? 
and making parts to replace metal components. And with that, I thank you for your time and attention today. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation, Jeff. So as we switch presenters, I'd like to remind everyone to send questions in the control panel on the bottom of your screen, in which we will answer at the conclusion of the three presentations. I see a couple have already popped in. And as I introduce the next speaker, you should see a poll come up on your screen about the previous presentation. So if So if you could answer that quickly here, I'm gonna go ahead and start introducing our next speaker, Dr. Brian Mullen of Evolve Additive Solutions. Evolve Additive Solutions spun out of Stratasys Innovation Labs in 2018. Evolve Step technology delivers high volume production using a wide range of thermoplastics at speeds of up to 50 times faster than the current fastest process. The highly scalable and extensible solution combines Evolve's own proprietary technology with the proven capability of electrophotographic imaging. Dr. Brian Mullen is currently a process engineering manager for Evolve. Since May 2019, Brian has worked with Evolve, uh, which is an additive manufacturing startup geared towards the production of thermoplastic materials. Dr. Mullen is an inventor on 45 issued US patents he received his BS in chemistry from the University of Southern Indiana and his PhD in polymer science and engineering from the University of Southern Mississippi. After receiving his PhD, Brian worked for GE Plastics for five years as a product developer and platform chemist. After leaving GE, Brian worked for Segetus, a renewable chemistry startup in the Twin Cities where he was the chief scientific officer. In 2016, Brian joined BASF, where he was the technology manager for the construction uh, chemicals business. So as I turn it over to, to Brian, thank you for answering the poll question. So. Okay. Should I go ahead and start? Uh, yeah, go ahead and start, Brian. Okay. Well, uh, first, before I get started, I want to thank the organizers and the other speakers today. Uh, really uh, thankful for um, your attention today as I go through, um, you know, our company Evolve Additive Solutions and, and what we believe is uh, the first additive manufacturing platform for thermoplastic production. So our, our uh, technology is focused on thermoplastics. Thanks. Enough of the, about me. Thanks for the introduction. Um, already. So let's uh, go ahead and, and dive in. Uh, before, um, you know, I dive into the technology, um, I just want to spend a couple of minutes to talk about our startup company, Evolve Additive Solutions, since you may have not heard about us. Um, Evolve's mission is to produce innovative manufacturing solutions that enable our customers uh, with revolutionary new manufacturing tools and capabilities. We're headquartered in Minnetonka, Minnesota near the Twin Cities metropolitan area with a materials technology center also uh, based in Rochester, New York. Um, we have a number of development systems at our headquarters and uh, one is also installed at one of our customers in Europe. Um, our technologies and solutions are focused entirely around production applications, not prototyping. And we are focused on real world commercially available thermoplastics and we have also over 100 patents on additive manufacturing technologies. So our step process started within Stratasys as an R&D project many years ago. In 2017, we completely spun off of Stratasys. Um, Steve Chilson, our CEO, and, and also our co-founder raised a Series A funding in 2018, led by some very well-known strategic investors and we also shipped our first alpha system in 2018. In the last couple of years, we have established strategic partnerships uh, with some of our key customers and supply chain partners. And today we are on track to deliver our commercial production systems in the early 2021 timeframe. We are taking orders presently and looking to the future in our roadmap 
for factory integration using the industry 4.0. So we do more than just manufacture systems. We also develop materials and software capabilities. Um, so we're a whole system solution approach. And as such, we have strategic partnerships with uh, vendors um, of uh, raw materials like Evonik and Kodak. And also we have strategic uh, uh, partnerships in our systems and control. So with Rockwell Automation and Siemens, two very well known in this area. Our investors are uh, Stratasys, um, which we uh, spun out of. Also Stanley Black & Decker. I'm not for sure if you saw the uh, release that was put out a few days ago, but Stanley Black & Decker also is continue to um, um, uh, fund us in, a, in another investment round. Also Lego, um, based out of Denmark, is another one of our investors as well as a undisclosed investor that chooses to remain uh, secret at this time. So let's discuss the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, we believe that additive manufacturing at production scale has many compromises. And in terms of pro prototyping, we're not talking about that because Evolve is focused on production scale. And we're working to overcome those compromises. For example, if you want to get parts into your supply chain quickly, you probably have to compromise on quality or cost, um, quality versus injection molding maybe and pay a much higher cost um, to get those parts out. And if these two attributes are compromised um, more often than not, you will not have a sustainable product or process. Um, so we work and live by these five key pillars, cost, so similar cost, um, because we take advantage of uh, commercially raw, available raw materials um, to date, speed. Um, so our cycle time is very fast and comparable to injection molding in terms of the number of parts produced uh, per build uh, quality. So our repeatability in terms of accuracy and surface finish and mechanical properties are on par with injection molding. Uh, we are scalable and taking advantage of implementing the industry 4.0 integration into our process. And also we have a lot of closed loop control systems within our um, hardware and software um, that enables us to scale. And then also we don't just print one material we um, print semi-crystalline and amorphous engineering thermoplastics um, that are commercially available. So, um, and these can be uh, very hard thermoplastics or even thermoplastic elastomers. So the solution to this problem is something we have trademarked a scalable volume production platform. So it involves SVP, uh, a schematic of the picture of our machine is shown in this diagram. And um, as I mentioned, uh, we have a number of development systems here in Minnetonka, and all of that development has led into this new Evolve SVP platform. And we say that we can deliver um, mass customization, for example, just in time production, unmatched quality all at the same time. Um, but it really goes back uh, to the five uh, key pillars that I mentioned on the, on the last slide. And um, so, Let's dive into the technology um, a little bit more detail. So I'm very technical um, a person with a PhD in polymer science. So um, at a high level though, um, this is similar to what Jeff had talked about in terms of his additive manufacturing uh, process and how their company was founded. Ours very similar too on taking something that was done in two dimensions and applying it in three dimensions. And so what was uh, going on in the industry was derived from Eastman Kodak. They had an electrophotographic deposition process in which they printed um, uh, layers in, or uh, printed on paper in two dimensions, very selectively using electrochemistry. And this is way different than um, what is typically used today to print powders in three dimensions. So, we have an entirely new process that takes advantage of the electrophotographic uh, part of the process. So we are not powder bed. We are not multi-jet fusion, not SLA, not SLS, or any other derivative. We are a brand new process that takes two-dimensional electrophotographic um, uh, process. And then we use that process over and over using injection molding like uh, types of processes in which we heat these um, uh, 
layers that are in two dimensions. Uh, we heat them above their glass transition temperature. We use pressure to fuse the uh, images together and then we cool them off below their TG and we repeat. And this is done over and over, over a thousand times until we get our 3D printed build. And uh, then we move on to a post-processing step where we isolate the 3D printed parts. So the EP, the EP technology is, is actually well understood. Um, you know, Kodak has been practicing this technology for decades. And what we can take is we could take advantage of their selective electrochemistry approach in which we create these uh, 10 micron to 25 micron thick images and we fuse them together over and over until we create our 3D printed parts. And these very small um, uh, layer thicknesses enable us um, to have a very dense part with isotropic properties in all directions as well as really good accuracy. Um, so I can elaborate on it in a little bit more detail. Um, certainly we have some movies either on our uh, Vimeo uh, site or on our website. Um, but in terms of breaking down the overall step process, uh, we've broken it down to about six, sorry, nine steps. So in that very first picture there, if you can see my cursor, these are five electrophotographic printing Im images um, that can hold different materials in there. Uh, we can hold four different uh, materials. They can be different colors, as you can see in picture two. And um, we always have one uh, material, one of these uh, uh, printing images or engines that is a, a sacrificial support. And so that is printed alongside of our thermoplastic materials. But basically uh, through um, electrochemistry, uh, we charge our uh, polymer particles in a negative uh, uh, charge and adheres to these positively charged cylinders. And um, the positive charges are only in certain sections that is read being read by our software that creates these images um, and feeds them to our, um, our um, hardware. And then we can get really nice images of part and support. And um, in image five, you see a full um, layer that's being transferred, has been transferred to a belt. This is a continuous belt that um, uh, moves through um, our step technology system until it hits uh, step number seven, which this is our transfuse roller. So in this area, there are um, part heaters that really heat up um, the incoming layer as well as the build, which is coming um, through this X stage right here. So the image comes on top of our part build and you can see in step eight, um, we have um, a certain uh, Z height that builds up after we have transferred so many images over and over until we finish the build. And so you can see the parts, at least with this cartoon, you can see the parts within this build. However, most of our materials are um, uh, black or uh, blue in nature. And, and so it might be difficult to see them in the final build. Our final builds look like a pretty large rectangle. And then after um, the rectangle is put into a post-processing um, machine, the parts uh, come out and, and we analyze them. These are some of the uh, parts. We've created some really nice, um, amazing uh, demonstration parts that uh, you guys can see. So our materials, um, as, I, as I mentioned, um, they, they can be printed in multicolor. So this was done within one build. We have blue ABS, we have uh, black ABS, or these could also be uh, thermoplastic elastomers. Um, alongside a support which is dissolved away, we end up with parts um, that uh, some of these have gears in them that can be moved. We also, um, because ABS is very well known uh, to be chrome platable, you can uh, make a, a, a series of custom automotive and different badges um, created with our materials. Um, and then, uh, you know, we can also create uh, fully functioning uh, parts like um, the cell phone um, holder here, this is all made within one build uh, within our step process. Um, you can also see from the SEM image in the middle here, 500X magnification. This is a cross-sectional area in which we have taken apart and broken it in half and looked at the cross-section. You can see a fully dense material. So we do not have a lot of voids um, in our materials. They are fully fused 
And as such, we have uh, really nice uh, impact strength, tensile strength uh, properties. Some of the other uh, types of materials that, that uh, you guys can see is we made assemblies. Um, so after the supports washed away, uh, you know, we can make interconnected parts. If this video would play, um, this, this um, dial would spin. And uh, these are made out of um, just um, regular uh, commercially available thermoplastic materials. Uh, this whole pen was um, made in one build and, and just assembled. The only thing that uh, needed to be assembled uh, was the spring within it and the um, ink um, cartridge in it. So um, really great uh, displays of what we can do. Um, also, uh, if these videos would play, it, it's really cool. These are made out of a thermoplastic elastomer. These sections here, the top and bottom is made out of a uh, just a harder thermoplastic uh, like ABS. And uh, this video show, and it's on our website if you guys want to check us out. Um, it, it just shows that springiness. Um, and this was all created with uh, one build um, as well, taking advantage of our multi-material uh, uh, builds that, that we can uh, build. And then in this picture, at least, you, you guys will be able to tell what um, is going on here. But we've taken something like ABS, which is in green, and red, which is a thermoplastic elastomer. It's actually a PIBA uh, a polyethylene oxide block amide material that's very flexible. And in this video, um, it won't play for you. I'm not even going to try. But that one side of the tensile bar really is flexible, and the other one is really stiff. And so you can create uh, really um, nice uh, materials. It's, um, it doesn't have a knit line in between. You could, you could do this with injection molding where these materials would meet in the middle if they, they would have the right uh, rheology, but you would have that knit line. In the case of th these materials, this is a very, um, you know, um, this is something that we design in our software and that we print. And so that both materials are, um, spaced interstitch um, together uh, within our parts. So uh, really unique uh, uh, materials. And so um, some of the other uh, capabilities, you know, I went over uh, a lot of these, so I won't uh, go into a lot more details, but um, we can really take advantage. Um, I don't have any uh, examples of, of the different types of semi-crystalline materials um, that we have printed with. Uh, but I'll, I'll just tell you about them. So um, like what Mark mentioned earlier with his process, so nylon six, um, crystal, semi-crystalline nylon 11, uh, we have printed with um, nylon 12. And um, so we can really, uh, you know, t span the gamma of really higher performance uh, types of materials of semi-crystalline as well as amorphous materials. We do have a process window, um, though we can't, you know, probably couldn't process peak right now, like uh, what Impossible Objects is doing. Um, so our process window is, is probably an upper temperature limit around 220C, and, uh, but we can um, span the, the, the gap down to lower uh, melting point materials. Uh, but we are working in expanding our process window um, using some other um, technologies to get us to the higher performance materials in the future. And so uh, really with, uh, you know, we're not just a machine. Uh, we're not uh, really a system. We, we offer materials, um, you know, very uh, precise particle size materials. Uh, we offer um, our machines, of course, and then also outstanding service and the capability with our software and uh, being able to be integrated into 4 point, industry 4.0. Um, we have a lot of different capabilities um, that's really hard for me to talk about in 15 minutes. And I hope that um, I gave it a good enough overview so that um, if you wanted to follow up, you could follow up with me. Um, I'm the build processing engineering manager here at Evolve, as well as Andy or Cheryl, who are both in our marketing um, department um, here at Evolve. And um, just a, a picture of where we're at, you know, Minnetonka and then Rochester, um, New York. So. Um, a couple of uh, hour flight away, um, you know, and uh, we really work closely uh, with, with our team. Um, my boss actually um, sits in, in Rochester. So um, with these times, you know, that it's uh, really difficult. I really 
to get together. I really appreciate everybody attending this virtual uh, symposium to, today, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, we're gonna save the questions to the end, and I see a few have maybe come through uh, during the uh, presentation there. So I uh, thank you once again for your presentation, and I'm gonna launch another poll. Uh, so you should see that come up on your screen now. So if you can take a look at that and answer really quickly. Um, our next presenter is Pat McCusker, co-founder and chief operations officer at Fast Radius. Fast Radius is a leading expert in both additive and traditional manufacturing. From application discovery and design to manufacturing and fulfillment, Fast Radius is building a disruptive production model fueled by a combination of the latest and advanced manufacturing technologies and proprietary software that enables a digital thread across the product's manufacturing cycle. Fast Radius was named one of the world's nine most innovative factories by the World Economic Forum. Pat McCusker leads commercial operations, ensuring uh, Fast Radius supports their clients with the software tools, engineering expertise, and industrial grade production required to drive additive applications from discovery through market launch. Prior to Fast Radius, Pat was president North America at Inner Workings, which is a technology enabled marketing services firm. And prior to Inner Workings, he was an associate partner with McKinsey and Company, where he served technology clients across a wide range of functions. And before McKinsey, Pat held cross functional leadership roles at multiple early stage growth companies. Pat holds an MBA from the University of Chicago and a BA from the University of Notre Dame. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, end this poll here, and we can go ahead and switch over to you, Pat, if you want to take over. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining today, and look forward to a uh, productive conversation. Let me see if I can just share my screen here. Uh, All right, is everybody able to see my screen okay? Great. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, just to give everybody a bit more color on Fast Radius, uh, talk a little bit about our business, and then I think there's, there's no better way to make it real other than showing some, some case studies and talking through how we work with our customers day in, day out uh, in a number of different ways. So first, fast radius, we help companies through the entire uh, product development life cycle. So from discovery and kind of understanding what is now possible with new advanced manufacturing techniques, uh, whether it be an evolve or impossible objects or, or many, many others, and, and really deeply understanding those new technologies, their capabilities, and, and what applications those new technologies may unlock for a client's business. Uh, as, as we narrow down a potential application, we then help with the design and engineering of particular products and, and uh, applications. And then ultimately we produce end use parts. So we have a, uh, actually a, a two factories, industrial grade factories with some of the latest additive manufacturing uh, technology materials at our fingertips and, and are making real end use parts at meaningful scale in, in these factories. And then finally fulfillment and, and, and shipping these parts wherever they're needed around the world uh, with our partner UPS. Uh, importantly, this entire workflow from the discover, design, make, and fulfill is powered by the Fast Radius operating system. And this is a proprietary software stack that facilitates the entire life cycle, uh, whether it be interaction with design engineers or quality audits and, and, and lock tracing all captured in our, in our cloud. Uh, it's, it's a tool that's purpose built to make this entire process more seamless, more tech enabled, and just more modern. Uh, I believe it was mentioned in the introduction, but we're, we're proud to have been recognized by the World Economic Forum as having one of the most advanced factories in the world, alongside companies you know, like Johnson and Johnson and, and Roche and, and other large uh, global uh, Fortune 100 companies. Uh, I think it speaks to the kind of end-to-end -end digital process that we've built here and, and, and really linking each of these steps with a software tool uh, that also integrates into actual manufacturing and, and, and part production. Uh, so we're proud, by this proud about this recognition. We think it is indicative of, uh, of, 
of the special company that we're building here. Uh, I think this was touched on in, in the last couple of uh, presentations, but just at, at the most uh, kind of highest level, what we're seeing with uh, additive manufacturing and, and other advanced manufacturing techniques is you have two phenomena. One is you have improved material properties. Uh, so many of you may be familiar with FDM, but you now have things like the impossible objects, uh, uh, carbon fiber material, the, the ABS that, uh, that the Evolve folks are working on, and countless others that are now getting to parity with materials that have been around for, for decades with traditional techniques. So that's the first big, big uh, shift in the market. And then the second is the improved economics. So uh, even just a couple years ago, uh, the economics for, for larger scale production were prohibitive. Uh, sure, you didn't have to cut a teal tool, but the per piece price was so high, it only made sense if you were doing a handful of units. And now we have applications where it's hundreds of thousands, some cases even millions of units, where it's more cost effective purely on the economics to make a part with additive versus, uh, versus traditional techniques. Of course, many other variables go into play there in terms of uh, customization and, and new geometries and other sources of value, but just from a, a raw economics perspective, we are seeing uh, a lot of cases where there's meaningful cost advantage at, at uh, at much higher volumes than there once was. And so on the right there are just some examples of, of applications that are enabled by these two phenomena. As I mentioned, we thought it'd be helpful to talk through a couple case studies to try and make it real. Uh, sorry, before, before we go there, just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the benefits of, of that additive brings to product development. So in a traditional world, you know, you're, you're cutting tools, you're waiting for those tools to be uh, to be, to be finished and then you're cutting and then you're making parts and then you're testing those parts and then you're recutting tools. And, and in the additive world, you can get real functional parts in your fingertips in a matter of hours, which just dramatically accelerates the product development cycle. And, and we've had many of our customers who have gone from, you know, what typically would take 18 months uh, is, is done in, in a matter of weeks, given the, the massive efficiencies of, uh, of producing it with additive and, and not having to worry about tool up, tooling up and still having a part that's not just a prototype, but actually a functional and use part that uh, uh, sure is used as a prototype, but, but is actually the same as what would be used in production. All right, now I've got a couple case studies. So, so first, uh, uh, one that, that uh, maybe if you've some folks in the line, we work with a subsidiary of Toyota Advanced Logistics, a firm called Bastion Solutions. And we've been working with them for a couple of years now to develop a new type of um, materials handling device. And what you see here is a, a autonomous robot for fulfillment centers, big pack and ship centers. Uh, and you'll see these, these rubber grips that uh, are produced on the, on the fingertips of the robot. Uh, it's an entirely unique geometry that could only be made with additive manufacturing. So that geometry is not moldable. There are internal channels there. Uh, the, that webbing would be really, really hard, if not impossible to tool up. And so this is a, a geometry you couldn't make any other way, and it creates a functionality that uh, you could not duplicate with foam. It, it's a very versatile um, grip that, as you can see, is able to connect and pick up a wide range of, of products from a box of Kleenex to a, to a can of soup. Uh, what's interesting in this example is as we started working on this uh, grip, and as we got to know the Bastion and Toyota team, we uh, helped them with the rest of the design of the robot. So you see the arm here is, uh, is actually made with additive. In fact, almost half of the bill of materials of this uh, autonomous robot is made with additive manufacturing. Uh, so we've got HP, we've got carbon, we've got Stratasys, uh, all coming together to make a, uh, a production robot that is, that is uh, coming to market. That's one case example. Uh, another one is Aptiv. So Aptiv is a tier one automotive supplier and we've been working with them to produce uh, parts that are now on actual vehicles. Uh, so this is what you see here is an electrical connector for a towing system. Uh, it's relatively low volume. They only need you know, thousands a month, not millions or hundreds of thousands. And, uh, and as they looked at the uh, benefits of additive and not having to tool up and, and being able to dial in their volume exactly as, as, as they needed, uh, it, was, it was hugely beneficial and, and hit the quality 
and uh, sustainability that they required for this application. Uh, it's one of the first kind of publicly recognized uh, uh, parts that are on a production vehicle and, and something we're really proud about here at Fast Radius. Uh, the next example I wanted to share is with Santerra, the division of Airbus. We've been working with them for a couple of years and have developed a virtual warehouse for many of their tools. So uh, when, when, when airplanes are down, they have uh, all sets of tool, all kinds of different tools to do uh, regular maintenance and repair. And uh, we've helped them both design, redesign these parts with additive manufacturing. So consolidating parts, uh, doing things like, like color, what you see here with, with HP's color machine. We've also combined traditional manufacturing with the virtual warehouse. So it's not just additive in this case, we're also making CNC parts, uh, injection mold, actually no, I'm sorry, not injection mold parts, CNC parts and, and additive parts uh, together to um, provide uh, a full suite of tools for this virtual warehouse program. Um, excuse me, one, really exciting kind of stat from this program was uh, we, we found that the traditional kind of procurement timeline for some of these parts was, was literally weeks uh, when, when they needed to get a part and, and they needed to get a new, a new repair complete. We helped them in, in one instance within 48 hours. So we hadn't even made the part. It wasn't sitting on a shelf. They ordered the part, we produced it, shipped it, and it was in their hands within 48 hours. Uh, just an entirely new supply chain, just uh, un unprecedented speed and, and agility that, uh, that this program brings versus the traditional techniques. <clears throat> uh, and then finally, I wanted, wanted to talk a little bit about some of the work we're doing with uh, COVID-related uh, programs. So we have been working with our friends at Carbon and Resolution Medical to design and produce swabs that are used in COVID testing. And uh, it's, it's a unique geometry. You can see there this kind of uh, lattice structure there that uh, is, is certainly not moldable. And it is a very effective way to collect a sample. Uh, it's made with a resin that's used for, uh, for, for, for dental. And so we know it's biocompatible and safe. And so this is uh, now ramping up, being used in, in real world testing, and we're really excited about this application as a, uh, a, a phenomenal example of how you can use additive to move very, very quickly in a world where, uh, in the case of COVID, supply has far, um, I'm sorry, demand has far exceeded supply, and, and additive is helping to fill the gap there. The video of the, uh, the squad production in action. Uh, I want to share another example, and this is a bit more of a, a hybrid example. So as I mentioned, we, we do additive manufacturing primarily, but we also help companies with other traditional and, and other advanced manufacturing techniques. So in this case, uh, a company called Curtis Motorcycle is developing a electronic, I'm sorry, a, a electric motorcycle uh, came to us and, and they wanted the, the best tools available, the best manufacturing technologies available. And in this case, it was a combination of CNC machining, additive, uh, injection molding, and, and, and a few other technologies and, and techniques that we're bringing to bear uh, to help design and, and ultimately launch this new electric motorcycle with Curtis. Um, it's, a, it's a program we're really excited about, and I think a testament to this kind of overarching uh, holistic approach we have and, and not being tied to one manufacturing technique, but, but using our software tools to help companies understand what's now possible and, and navigate through the production process. Uh, and then finally, just a kind of a capstone here as we think about uh, the future of supply chains and, and what additive can do, we think this ultimately can usher in what we refer to as the fourth modality of logistics. So for uh, most of the last couple generations, we've had three primary ways of, of moving products around the world for air, ground, and sea and you can now move parts at the speed of light over the internet. So if you have a, a production site, a certified production site in Europe and a certified production site in, in Asia and a certified production site in the US, it doesn't really matter uh, which of those sites produces your part. You can produce that part most adjacent to the point of consumption. And, and we think that's just a profound uh, 
phenomenon that is un unlocked by, by additive and other advanced techniques and, 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 and digital at the core. Uh, this, is, this is one of the reasons we're partnering with our friends at UPS and uh, are excited about this virtual warehouse offering with, with Airbus and many others. Uh, ultimately, just in, in, in wrap up here, our mission is to make new things possible to advance the human condition. Uh, we believe manufacturing is important, not just for what it makes, but for what it makes possible. And we are thrilled to be bringing in these new manufacturing techniques to uh, product innovators and, and helping them launch them at real global scale. Thank you again for your time and look forward to any questions that uh, the, the, the group may have. Pat, thank you so much for that excellent presentation. Uh, lots of great information in there. You know, I'd like to remind everybody to keep uh, putting in some questions here as we move to the panel session. I'm, uh, I'm gonna launch one final poll. Uh, you should be able to see that on your screen here. Um, so, you know, I was gonna give a, just a general question to kind of kick it off. Um, you know, maybe five to 10 years ago, 3D printing, and there was a lot of hype around it, you know, kind of maybe what you see today with artificial intelligence or some other kind of hyped words. Uh, where do you see 3D printing today versus five years ago? And where do you see it maybe in going in the next five, 10 years? And that's just for the entire panel. So if somebody wants to kick off. And unmute yourself. This is Brian. Sorry. I know everybody's going to jump in. Uh, I can just say um, it's very, it's in a very exciting time right now. I think a lot of uh, companies are geared towards production and going a little bit away from prototyping. And I think um, now, uh, I think you'll see the industry start to move more in that area. That's what I can see. And with, with that, that means volumes go up, costs go down, and uh, just more growth. So that's where, where I can see the industry headed. <laughs> Uh, this is this is Jeff. My uh, my perspective. If you look back five years ago, um, boy, there's been a lot of new uh, technology com companies come into the fold in the last five years, which I think has been really good for the industry as a whole. Um, patents have expired. Um, open source systems have come about, but I think that it's been uh, where we are today. It's been an integration of predictive software tools now. Um, test standards available, um, large install base of machines worldwide uh, that's been characterized. Now you got new technologies coming on board. And if you fast forward five years from now, we're living in a digital world where everything moves so fast and you can pass files from Japan to companies, uh, to your, your, your factories in the US or vice versa. And when you hear You're muted, Jeff. When you look at uh, the integration of um, Industry 4.0 of all the software tools to the equipment uh, connected to the supply chain and being able to uh, pass those files around like Fast Radius is doing, that's going to become kind of more of a common theme for industries uh, large and small as we uh, charge into the future, especially if you're looking at either um, mid to low volume manufacturing. And then, if you're, and then if you're doing high volume manufacturing for products that have long product life cycles, you have to support them over the, over the years. And so additive manufacturing is almost uh, a perfect technology that can provide those uh, spare parts to cause um, for sustainment, for low cost sustainment. Pat, do you have a comment? Unmute yourself, please. Uh, I certainly agree with Jeff and Brian on, on both those points. I think the other um, kind of quantitative lens that, that I often put on it is, uh, sure, there's been hype and, and there have been um, kind of some starts and stops in the industry over the last few years, particularly on kind of the production side of things. But I think what's exciting is, is, is now it's not really a matter of debate. Like the, the numbers just, they are what they are. And, and the cost curves are what they are. And, and so you kind of look at those numbers and, uh, and, and the economics are real. And, and so uh, we, we look at that as, as just, um, it's, it's not really a qualitative statement anymore to say that uh, it, 
it's it's production ready. There really is some hard uh, hard numbers on both the economics and the technical specifications to support the assertion. Thank you. Uh, this is a little bit more of a technical question. Uh, how competitive is your process compared to injection molding for a more mass production scale of nylon 66 parts as opposed to using a Sumitomo 280 or a Nisei DFX 400? And this is to all presenters as you wish to answer it. Jeff? Well, I put a, I put a response out there. <clears throat> So my answer, it's going to depend. It's going to depend on your, your, your part geometry. And does your nylon 6.6 six parts have any fibers in it? And so if it's a neat part, if it's just a pure nylon 6.6 six part, after you made the investment in the tooling, it's really hard to beat injection molding far as um, your cycle times are typically down in seconds or minutes. Um, but if you're looking at doing more complex injector molded parts with long fibers, um, low to mid volume, then the impossible objects process might be very competitive uh, on getting there. So it requires further research and really understanding of what the, the part geometries look like and what the requirements are there. But if it's, if it's neat nylon 6.6, six, injection molding is hard to beat. Yeah, this is Brian. So we are not in the process window right now to print nylon 6.6. Six. Uh, we are printing with nylon six, so uh, we hope in the future uh, that we'll get there. Um, however, um, a lot of different materials can be substituted with nylon six. So um, if uh, the specifications would meet something uh, like what you're talking about, please send me an email. Thanks. Pat, do you have any comment with that or? I don't. I'm sorry. I don't have any. Uh... Well, actually, I, 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 have, I do have a question here for you, Pat. What, what were the key points for getting or becoming one of the nine best factors in the world from the uh, World Economic Forum? Yeah, so they evaluated over a thousand factories around the world, and uh, they were really looking at a broad set of, you know, kind of the industry 4.0 markers. So things like the digital thread, things like software at every step of the process, uh, things like, you know, sophisticated quality management systems, uh, things like the most advanced manufacturing techniques, uh, in our case, additive. Uh, so, so there are a number of kind of what I've broadly characterized as, as industry 4.0 uh, criteria, and, and they were really excited about kind of the, uh, how much we were pushing the envelope on, on what's now possible with these broad set of tools. Thank you. And this is a question for Jeff. Uh, in terms of 10 times faster, what is your base, base method? Is that fused deposition modeling or I think it's high speed centering if I'm not mistaken. Jeff? So yeah, just to specify, so we're, there's kind of a, 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 a big deep dark secret for those that's been in the additive uh, 3D printing uh, things out there. So when I talk about 10 times faster, I'm talking about just the printing piece of it. The, the downstream um, post finishing piece of it um, is different than the printing piece. So the 10 time X is compared to extrusion processes. When you take the equivalent part, build it on a CBAM machine for printing, look at the build time and that compare it to an extrusion process, that's gonna be uh, the 10 X, something would take, um, is is what we're referencing on that front, just on the upfront printing piece of it. It's not holistically the whole process. Okay, uh, and and just a general question here, and this is on temperature. What temperature range for these components can 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 they perform without losing performance or uh, function? Sorry, I'm trying to. Is that is that to I/O or is that to somebody else? I think that's to to whoever wants to answer here. But yeah, what temperature range will these components? Uh, how, what temperature range can they perform? Uh, so for so for how losing performance. So for impossible objects, if we do a carbon fiber peak, which is going to be um, a highest performing uh, material combination, um, we actually melt the peak materials around 400 degrees C. Um, typical use temperatures for the applications could probably see 300 to 325 degrees C. Um, for, the, for the different types of nylons, uh, the melt point is approximately 
200 degrees C, and you're going to probably see use temperatures probably between 150, 160 a C for the for the various nylons. Maybe a little higher higher for nylon six. Brian, do you have anything you want to add to that, or? Yeah, um, uh, slightly lower than what uh, Jeff had had mentioned, uh, um, but uh, since we were printing with nylon six, so in the 150 ish range, and then also some amorphous thermoplastics that we print with have heat distortion temperatures around 110 to 135. So I think use temperatures can be around 100 C um, or so. If we're talking ABS, I'm thinking it's 80 C as a um, upper limit there. So a range, but a little bit lower, but in, in an area where a lot of plastics are used, certainly. Sure. And uh, Brian, I think I have one more question. Here about the step system and actually it's a two-part question is it already commercialized and then how fast is the step process compared with the FDM process? Yep so the answer to the first question we are presently um, working on the first few commercial systems so we plan to launch those in 2021 first quarter or second quarter 2021 um, so look forward to that and then as far as the speed versus FDM printing we're not two orders of magnitude faster I'll say it's one order of magnitude, but I think it's been quoted around 50, 50 X. Um, so, but like what uh, Jeff said, I mean, you got to take into account post-processing and things like that. We print fast and then also we can post-process pretty fast, which FDM sometimes requires. Um, so yeah, uh, order of magnitude. Okay, and, and here's another question just in general for everyone here. Um, is there anything special that a company needs to take in consideration when they are designing something for 3D printing, when they're designing a part, designing whatever. So anybody want to jump in on that? Sure, I will since my, I'm already unmuted. I think um, the, the, um, when a person wants to 3D print a part, they need to know what properties the material needs, you know, and what application it's going into, what's, what types of in, environment is uh, going to be uh, needed? Does it need flame retardant? Uh, you know, does it need um, a certain um, uh, temperature window or a length of time it needs to perform in the field? And um, those are all really important. And then to choose which technology, there are so many different companies that can, or machines that can print different materials. I think once you know the application and can uh, lead yourself down toward picking a resin, then there's certainly manufacturers that are really well versed in, in printing certain resins. So um, yeah, do your homework, that's for sure at, at first. Yeah. Jeff or Pat, do you have anything to add to that? Special consideration in designing for 3D printing? Yeah, this is Jeff. So what I would suggest, so I totally agree with what Brian just said, you know, uh, understanding your material requirements, your use, your, your use environment, et cetera, is absolutely paramount, but I'll just make a general one, is if you're taking a part that was originally designed for a, a traditional manufacturing process and say, hey, I want to print that, um, you really kind of have to delete that thinking out of your head because now this is an opportunity. You've got a lot of freedom of, um, freedom of design and freedom of build for many of these additive processes out there that's a real opportunity to step back and redesign your part to make a better part, combine parts into, you know, something that might be an assembly that may have 10 parts that you can maybe make it into one integrated assembly and build it with whatever the appropriate uh, material and pro additive material and process is, is that you really have to change your thinking on, on your, your, your upstream part design and take advantage of what these additive processes give you. Yeah, I think I certainly agree, Jeff and, and Brian. Um, I think the other, the other thing I would overlay here is just the economic lens and ensuring that uh, you're taking into account the uh, the benefits and the cost of additive, right? The benefits being you don't have to tool up, but the, but the costs are typically uh, a bit higher on a per piece cost. Uh, and so understanding that as you're, as you're working through your design process and really taking a holistic view of uh, of the fit and the, and the applicability of an additive process across both the technical parameters and the economic benefit. 
Hey, I'd like to add on to what Pat just said there, because when I was at Boeing and we were making massive investment into various types of capital equipment, um, most large corporations, and this might be true for smaller ones, typically will look at um, when they do their business case, internal business cases, what's, what's the non-reoccurring and reoccurring cost savings. But there's so much more than that. You know, if you have a product that's iterating, what's the cost of an engineering change order? What's the cost to carry inventory? Uh, what's all the logistics costs? These are all real hidden costs that I encourage everybody to at minimum identify. And if you can hang, uh, if you can hang uh, some costs onto that, it will, it will definitely uh, open a lot of people's eyes from a business case perspective. Because those are all real costs that all businesses have to, to deal with if, if, you're, if you're providing pro products to the market. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more, Jeff. Okay, uh, I just want to mention we still have some time for more questions here. I, I just wanted to give another general question on, on Japan. Japan, you know, it's a country with a declining population and hence a declining uh, labor force as well. So, you know, there seems like there's a lot of opportunity for 3D printing in the Japanese market. And obviously, they've been a big adopter, early adopter of uh, 3D printing technologies. Stratasys has been in Japan for nearly a decade now, I think. So, um, I just thought of maybe you could give some thoughts on what you think about Japan and 3D printing and maybe what you plan on doing there in the future. So, anybody? So with impossible objects, you know, I'll probably follow what a lot of typical additive companies will do. We'll probably have a Japanese distributor, start with a Japanese distributor doing part services in countries as a way to introduce it to the aerospace and automotive and other and the electronics industry within Japan, which are huge industries, uh, so that we can start to get the technology present in country with um, established people that do advanced manufacturing technology. And then from there, we'll then start to sell machines inside the country. Start with part services with an in-country distributor and then go to um, selling machines. And we're already in discussion. We, we know who some of those potential companies are when we're ready to uh, make that move. Senator Pat? Any comments? Yeah, we're, we're certainly excited about uh about Japan and Asia more broadly, but candidly, we're not there yet. Um, I think we're, we're uh, a click or two away from uh, making a meaningful move into, uh, into Asia and, and Japan. Yep, same with us. Um, currently, most of our customers actually are in Europe uh, present time and uh, some in the United States, but um, we look forward to working uh, with uh, several partners in, in Japan and we're starting that right now. So um, hopefully uh, we get some connections from this meeting. That would be great. We hope that too. Um, here's another question in the, in the box here. Most of these processes seem to be aimed towards larger scale and printing multiple pieces at a time. Do these machines and processes happen to come in a smaller size to make one or two piece projects? As an example, like an end of arm tool for our robots on the injection machines to pick the parts out? Anybody want to dive into that? Yeah, yeah so, so absolutely. I mean, you can, um, that, that's kind of one of the benefits of that. We've been talking a lot about production for sure, but, but the other uh, big benefit here is if you do just need to make 25 parts and you don't want to make the tool because it wouldn't make any sense, uh, additive is a great, um, a, a great technology for that type of application without a doubt. So, uh, of course, we're all excited about the, the larger volume runs and kind of the, the um, bigger applications, but there is a massive opportunity and, and, and value creation in these uh, lower value applications as well. Okay, I'll go ahead. Uh, we're mainly focused on larger production types of um, uh, runs. However, you know, per build, certainly, you know, there could be uh, just a few parts uh, but if you're really looking at a step machine, um, you really want to take advantage of, of uh, being able to build 24-7, um, uh, really. So um, that's, that's kind of where we're at, more focused on the production side. And Jeff, did you have a comment or? 
I do have another question for you, Jeff. Yeah, I kind of echo what the other two gentlemen said from my side. Okay, and well, and here's a question for you. In terms of the CVM system, what is process time ration among the number one, the print, the form parts, and the remove parts? Well, um, good question. And it's gonna depend on the material system. And, and I'll give you um, probably too, too much detail here. So if you do a nylon material, so printing nylon or peak, let's just say we print, we print basically three fiber sheets uh, a minute, 20 second cycle times per sheet. And uh, we stack those up. And so if we have a, a printout that takes two hours, nylon's gonna take basically two to four hours in a heated press. And then it's gonna probably take 10 or 15 minutes to um, remove it. So that's, that, that's your complete end-to-end -end, um, process time for carbon fiber nylon. If you use peak, the print time will be the same for peak, but because you have to melt peak at 400 degrees C, uh, the heating and cooling times are gonna be much longer. So that four hour could now be six to eight hours in, in a press because that's just, that's just the nature of peak. And so you're gonna get longer lead times in making carbon fiber peak samples, but then the finishing will be the same of, of 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, well, it looks like uh, that's all of our questions that have come in through the, the question system. Um, I just wanted to give another thank you to our three speakers and a virtual round of applause, of course. But um, if you guys would like to give a quick closing remark, um, I thought that would be a good time to do that now. And whoever wants to start. Pat? Sure, I'm happy to start. I think, uh, you know, as, as I discussed in, in my portion of the conversation, we Help companies at, at every stage of the design cycle. So if you have a, a new application that you're excited to explore, uh, leveraging additive manufacturing, please reach out. We'd be happy to talk. And, and if you're further along and are ready to start ramping up production on, on uh, an additive technology or other advanced technology, we'd also be able to, to help. So don't hesitate to reach out to, to myself or others at Fast Radius. Thank you again for your time. Okay, I'll go. Um, we're taking orders right now. So let me uh, leave with that. We are excited about the commercialization of our um, SVP uh, machines in 2021. So uh, thank you again for this opportunity to uh, virtually interact um, with a, a lot of, uh, I would say, new uh, partners and customers. Um, and please uh, send me or one of my colleagues a, a note if you're interested in our technology. Again, we're really focused on gearing towards production, um, you know, uh, very special types of uh, components for our customers. So thanks again. Also, thank you all for uh, the time this afternoon to learn about Impossible Objects technology. You know, if you're really looking for a composite material system for your products. And for those of you that understand that most composite, <clears throat> composite parts require a lot of touch labor, a lot of tooling, a lot of expensive equipment, this is, this is definitely a, a new way of doing those parts. And um, we'll be happy to talk to you. I think we're in some key markets which are, are crucial to the Japanese market. When you look at automotive, you look at aerospace, you look at electronics. Um, we have done some, some work there, and if there's some potential projects that you would like to maybe talk to us about, we're happy to sign your non-disclosure agreements and do a deeper dive into where we might be able to help you and, and do some first article testing with you. Okay, thank you once again, Pat, Jeff, and Brian. I want to thank all the attendees who joined today. I know we're all sitting through webinars every day here. It's kind of the, the nature of the, today's times, so... Uh, we look forward to you joining another JConnect webinar in the near future. We'll have another exciting topic for you hopefully here at the end of the month and end of July. This is the end of June. So thank you once again and uh, have a great day. Thanks. <laughs>